Where's Davis? He's running late. Well, we're gonna have to start without him. Today we've got land masses surrounded by water. And the first one is a small land mass surrounded by a huge ocean. What, what do you think that looks like? Well, like a small continent? No, smaller, way smaller. It is land though. Oh, it is land, yeah. Uh, maybe just call it is land. Is land, you know, that's what people would say when they see it. It's land, you know, is land. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. Well, uh, maybe you could pronounce the I differently, like a uh, Ice land, ice land, Iceland. Uh, we already named that one. And this is one of those, by the way. Well, uh, maybe you could just uh, drop the S, you know, just island. Island. I like it. Cool. No S then. No, 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 keep the S. Just don't pronounce it. <laughs> what, a silent S? Wouldn't that get confusing? Extremely. Silent S it is then. Yeah, moving on. Um, right, so the next one is a narrow strip of land separated by two bodies of water. Oh, we already named that one. Remember Peninsula? Because <laughs> it, it looks like a penis. <laughs> oh my god, I hit the floor. I laughed so hard at that one. That's why we named that one Florida. Uh, but no, this is, this is different. This actually connects two large land masses, like two continents. A land bridge? Mm, it's, that sounds temporary. It's not a bridge. It is land. Well, maybe we could do the same thing, you know, we got to island from is land. Maybe we could do is bridge, mm. is strip, is, is, <coughs> I like it. Isthmus is a very weird word to say, but there are several isthmuses around the world that have served major roles in war and trade that have shaped the course of our history. By the way, if isthmus is hard to say, I can now verify that isthmuses is Actually harder. Sounds like Mike Tyson trying to say Christmases. But of all the isthmuses in the world, none of them have been remotely as just utterly infuriating as the Isthmus of Panama. It was first discovered just over 500 years ago in 1513 by Spanish conquistador Vasco Nunez de Balboa. And yes, technically it was discovered thousands of years earlier by the natives that passed through there as they migrated from North South America, but Balboa was the first one that really understood its importance. The story goes that Balboa was exploring a mountain range near the Chukinake River in modern day Panama. And along the way, he reached the peak of a hill and he looked out and realized that he could see a whole other ocean on the other side. He could literally see the Pacific in one direction and the Atlantic in another direction. Now keep in mind, this entire landmass had just been discovered 21 years before that. They had no idea how big this was, and here he was standing in a place where he could see that it was just a tiny little strip of land that literally separated the entire Earth. You know, the whole reason they were sailing west in the first place was to find a new route to Asia that, that didn't require them to go all the way around Africa to get there. And here they find themselves face to face with a 40 mile wide stretch of land that is forcing them to do an 8,000 mile detour around South America to get there. And if that wasn't bad enough, you have to pass through the Drake Passage at the bottom of South America, which has some of the roughest seas in the world. But where you or I might see proof that God is a troll, Balboa saw opportunity. He thought for sure this was gonna be an important trade route someday, and he thought for sure that he could, you know, take advantage of that by subjugating the native peoples to his will. He was right about the first one, not so much right about the second one. Eventually Balboa crossed the wrong Spanish governor named Pedro Arias de Avila, who thought he was getting a little too big for his britches, so he had him beheaded, according to the britches law. But just really quickly, how did this whole thing get created in the first place? I mean, it's such a weird little strip of land. Like, how did that happen? It's kind of a geological rarity. About 50 million years ago, the Caribbean and Cocos tectonic plates collided and it set off underwater volcanoes. And those volcanoes did what volcanoes do. They erupted a lot, brought a lot of lava up to the surface and created a chain of islands between the two continents. These islands disrupted the ocean currents enough that sediment started to build up around it. And over about 12 million years, that sediment filled in and closed itself off completely. That's how you get an isthmus. So yeah, pretty much from the moment the Isthmus of Panama was discovered, people have been trying to put a canal through it. King Charles V of Spain ordered a survey for canal building purposes in 1534. In 1698, the Kingdom of Scotland tried to put a railway across the Isthmus, but nothing ever came of that. Even Thomas Jefferson put his engineering mind toward the canal in 1788, but it proved too difficult at the time. 
Now all this time there were roads that crossed the isthmus. The most notable one was the Las Cruces Trail, but it was a long journey over mountains and through rainforest that made getting heavy stuff through there pretty much impossible. It basically made the 8,000 mile journey around South America look worth it. Finally, in 1855, a railway was built across Panama at the cost of $8 million and 10,000 people died. So many people died that it created a cadaver market of selling these bodies off to medical schools that actually kind of kept the hospitals in business. But even still, it was a band-aid solution at best, especially for cargo. You know, you, you had to unload the boat, you had to make, take meticulous notes on all the inventory, get it on the rail, sh you know, go across the, the jungle and the mountains and get to the other side, and then you have to put it back onto a different boat, again, keeping track of all the inventory and everything. It was, it was a pain. So the next serious attempt at a canal was done by the French in 1881, and they were riding high at the moment on the success of the Suez Canal, which at the time was one of the biggest engineering feats in world history. So they tapped the same guy who built the Suez Canal, an engineer named Ferdinand de Lesseps, and uh, he thought he'd make short work of this project. After all, the Suez Canal was way longer than the Panama Canal would need to be. It was like three times longer. So he took a few trips to Panama and concluded that the whole thing would be a cakewalk. But as they say, pride goeth before the guy who doesn't know the difference between Egypt and Panama. The Suez Canal is a sea level canal across a flat plain. Panama is basically a string of volcanoes. The Suez is a dry desert environment. Panama is a freaking rainforest. Also, Lesep visited Panama during the dry season, which didn't give him a good idea of how things would work. So after months and months of his crews, you know, pickaxing through the jungle and through mountains and rock and everything, the rains would come and then just flood in everything with mudslides and water and just undo everything they just did. This also created some lovely breeding grounds for mosquitoes, which spread malaria and yellow fever, which killed up to 40 people a day on average. So when it became obvious that a sea level canal through Panama just absolutely wasn't going to work, they decided to do a lock system. And this is where they called up Gustav Eiffel to make that happen. Yes, that Gustav Eiffel. But at this point, it was too little too late. The money was dwindling and the body count had risen to 25,000 people and they were nowhere near close to actually completing this canal. Eventually, the project was scrapped. Lesep was investigated for misappropriating funds and bribery, but before he got brought to trial, he actually added himself to the body count when he died in December of 1894. And unlike the tens of thousands of people who died working for him, he got to die of old age. He was 89 years old. This whole thing was objectively a disaster, but it did get the ball rolling on the Panama Canal, which the United States picked up and ran with in 1902. Am I mixing metaphors there? In 1902, the U.S. passed the Spooner Act, which basically bought the Panama Canal Company from the French for $40 million. Now, this was controversial because a lot of people thought that Nicaragua would actually be a better place to build a canal, but the French had already gotten started on this, and they figured it would be easier to kind of pick up where they left off. Plus, the United States already owned that railroad I talked about earlier that would run parallel to the canal. Now, there was one tiny problem, which is that Colombia didn't want us there. Now, if you're asking why does it matter that Colombia didn't want us there, it's because Colombia owned Panama. The Isthmus of Panama was part of Colombia at the time. And the reason they didn't want us there was because they kind of feared that we would come in and try to like take over their country, which we had kind of just done in the Philippines. So on one hand you have Teddy Roosevelt saying he wants complete control of the canal, and on the other hand you have the Colombians who don't want to do that. They don't trust us to, to be good with that. So that really gave the U.S. only two options. One, respect the sovereignty of another country and walk away or encourage the people of Panama to revolt and form their own country with the express understanding that in return for our naval support, we get to build the canal and run it in perpetuity. Seeing as how there is now a country called Panama through which runs a canal, you can kind of guess which direction we chose. So after getting all, America, yeah. Panama got its independence and the United States got its canal, but we went about doing it a little bit differently than the French did. For one thing, by this time we understood a lot more about malaria and yellow fever and their connection to mosquitoes. So Colonel William C. Gorgas was placed in charge of sanitation, treating any standing water, putting up mosquito nets, fumigating buildings, that kind of thing. And it worked. The rates of malaria and yellow fever went way down during the American campaign. All in all, including accidents and disease, only 5,600 people died this go-around. You know, only 5,600 people. Yeah, for those of y'all doing the math, that all adds up to about 31,000 people that died building the Panama Canal. That's like 10 9-11s. The entire operation was placed under the Department of War. They, they framed it as a national security issue so that our Navy could get from one ocean to the other quickly. So it was all being directed by uh, Secretary of War William Howard Taft, which of course later became President of the United States. 
With the backing of the country's defense budget, Taft brought in heavy machinery that the French didn't have, and he also brought in dynamite. Lots of dynamite. Because if the War Department knew how to do anything, it was blow stuff up. Now, all of these factors helped with the American effort, but the real genius move was thought of by Chief Engineer John Stevens. So I mentioned the lock system earlier, just in case you're not a canal expert. The point of the lock system is to raise ships up above sea level. So this is one of the problems that Lesseps ran into. He actually wanted to create a sea level canal that just dug all the way down to sea level, but he found out that this volcanic rock was just too hard and too impassable. The whole thing was just kind of impossible. With a lock system, a ship enters a lock, which closes behind it, then the water's pumped in that raises the ship up to the level of the next lock. The ship then moves forward, then that one fills, raises the ship to the level of the next one, and so on and so forth until you get to the level of the canal. So they were doing the lock system in Panama, but there were still 40 miles of treacherous jungle and mountains to get through. But John Stevens had a brilliant idea. You could dam the Chagas River and create a lake right in the middle of the isthmus. Then you only have to build a canal to the lake, cutting the amount of canal building in half. More than half, actually. This changed everything. Now all you had to do was build the world's biggest dam at the time and create the world's biggest man-made lake at the time. Not to mention the locks, which were the biggest ones in the world at the time. Also not to mention a certain area called the Calberic Cut, which was basically the Continental Divide, which required leveling a mountain from 59 meters above sea level to 12 meters above sea level, and required removing 100 million cubic meters of rock. It was a Herculean effort, the likes of which the world had never seen, but regardless, they got it done, and two years early, no less. And finally, on August 3rd, 1914, after 401 years of planning and wishing to put a canal there, the first ship passed through the Panama Canal, and the entire world missed it. Because on that very same day, Germany declared war on France, which started World War I. But the effort was worth it, because almost immediately, 5% of world trade started traveling through the Panama Canal, and just like everybody predicted, it became one of the most strategic points in the entire world. And it's for that reason that the U.S. hung onto the ownership of Panama Canal for decades, even as tensions with Panama began to rise. Now eventually, big shock, Panama decided they wanted ownership of the canal, and the U.S. resisted even after supporting Egypt as they fought to get control of the Suez Canal from the British and the French in the 1950s. Not the best look. Now this finally got resolved during the Carter administration when a treaty was signed putting an end date to the United States ownership of the canal in 1999. So on January 1st in the year 2000, the Panama Canal finally became the property of the country of Panama. Today nearly 14,000 ships pass through the Panama Canal every year and it continues to shape the global shipping industry. In fact, the size of those locks kind of determined the size of cargo ships over the last century. The largest a ship can be and still fit in those locks is 1,050 feet long and 106 feet wide. So, of course, you know, shipping companies want to build their ships as big as they possibly can. So this became a class of ship called Panamax. And for a long time, that was plenty big for a cargo ship. But as technology evolved, you know, ships got bigger and bigger and eventually got to the point where it actually made more sense to build a bigger ship and sail it all the way around South America. So eventually, the Panama Canal needed to expand. So in 2016, the canal opened some new locks that can accommodate 1,200 feet long by 168 feet wide ships. This became known as Post Panamax. And in a great example of ripple effects, the new size ship meant that ports along the U.S. East Coast have spent tens of millions of dollars to upgrade their facilities. And it's created a whole industry of transport hubs in the Caribbean where Post Panamax ships unload their cargo onto smaller ships that can then hit any port in the East Coast. I should also mention it's not cheap to go through the canal. They charge by the number of shipping containers a boat has, and the largest boats can pay up to a half a million dollars just to pass through there. Now, the least anybody ever paid was Richard Halliburton, who swam the canal in 1928 and paid a whopping 36 cents for it. Random facts with Joe. And these tolls are always changing, by the way, according to the business of the day. They have to make sure that they're competitive with the Suez Canal and competitive against the possibility of people just, you know, porting in Los Angeles and going across rail through the United States. Plus, remember how some people were talking about putting a canal through Nicaragua? Well, that could still be a thing. Recently, a Chinese investment group signed a deal with the Nicaraguan government to do exactly that, though the deal seems to be stalled and not really going anywhere at the moment. So yeah, look, I've always known what the Panama Canal was, and I knew how important it was and everything, but I fell into a little bit of the history of it recently and was just blown away by what an achievement this was and how costly the whole thing was. I mean, yeah, its importance to the world is beyond measure, but 30,000 people lost their lives building it. The only construction project that killed more people was the Burma to Siam Railway, which was depicted in the Bridge on the River Kwai, but that was kind of a wartime thing, so to me that gets a bit of an asterisk. 
But in terms of peacetime construction projects, the Panama Canal is the deadliest one in modern history, maybe ever. For every mile of the canal, 500 people died, making the Isthmus of Panama quite likely the deadliest strip of land in the whole world. All right, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, I encourage you to either check out this video because Google thinks you'll like that or any of the others along the side over here that have my face on it. And if you like them, I do encourage you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. Fun t-shirts and other things available at the store at answersofjoe.com slash store. Thank you guys so much for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.